Welcome back for part three. Today we're going to clarify how the authority that rests in the church is, is activated. Now, a lot of people may have felt like they, you know, really don't have any say in the operation of their local church. You might have more influence than you think. But before turning to that, I want to deal with a problem, a question that's come up. Uh, some people see the church manual as some kind of a, uh, a lawyerly, it's, it's empowering some kind of a lawyerly priestcraft, uh, taking power, giving it power to sort of a priestly class, I guess the pastors and the administrators, and taking away power from the members. Uh, some people have that feeling. Is that the case? Is that, is that a fair and accurate, uh, is that a, a useful look at the church manual? Exactly contrary to that. The church manual in practice is, is one of the most important tools we really have to limit the misuse of power, to limit the authority of pastors and administrators, to limit the authority of church officers. Let's be realistic, too. I mean, the church manual is an imperfect document. Uh, people will misuse it. They'll misinterpret it. Some of them will misuse it for their own designing purposes. Some will try to use it to gain power or authority that's not been given to them. But isn't that true of any document? Some will seek to ignore it. Nevertheless, I'd like to you to uh, just take a moment with me here. I want you to consider a principle from one of the most important books uh, that I, I have, the book, The Great Controversy. Listen to this quote from page 610, 611. So long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it now is. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God, but statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable arguments Thus, a few men will hold in check a powerful current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third angel's message may do its work. So the Holy Spirit in measure controls the laws of the land and exerts a restraining influence. In like manner, the Holy Spirit in measure exerts a controlling influence on the church manual, and the church manual exerts a restraining influence on the exercise of authority in the church. In fact, were it not for the church manual, the condition of things in the church would be much worse than it now is. So the church manual is a means, not the only means, but it is a means by which the Holy Spirit works. And we'd really want to think long and hard before we uh, just throw away the church manual. There's an additional argument I want to put out there favoring the use of the church manual. So try this. No church organization can, can function very long if if the participants, if the members feel like they can't trust their church. And how do you create that trust? Well, actions demonstrating faithfulness to shared values, that's, that's one of the ways you really build trust. And the church manual provides a standard by which the, the faithfulness of the, of the church group that supports it can, you know, that's a way that you can measure how faithful they are. Do they go by their own rules or do they just disregard it? Do they just, are they just willy-nilly flying all over the place? And so the church manual becomes a, a way of measuring whether the church is trustworthy. Are you with me so far? The church organization, by having its own church manual, is kind of setting up a, a standard, a standard by which it can be, we can find out whether they keep their own rules. If the church doesn't keep its own rules, if it doesn't keep its own standards, why then how could it even begin to be trustworthy? So just by having a church manual, you are setting up a standard, a way to judge and evaluate and we can see whether the church is doing what it says it will do. If it won't keep its own rules, how could I trust it for any other thing? So God is good. God gives us what we need. And trust is absolutely essential for the church. And so you have to have trust. The church manual kind of forces us to be faithful. Who's going to trust you if you can't even keep your own, your own procedures and rules settled? So there's another force there built in design checks and balances on these procedures that will help us to be faithful. So now here's one more thought too. Some have derided the church manual. They say, oh, this is a, this is a Roman Catholic, you know, a way to take power from the members and give power to a group of, of uh, priests or administrators or whatever. Well, I want you to know, surely you know, that, that the, the, the way that that power works coming in, the, in, the, in a church organized like the papacy, that is top-down power. 
This is uh, bottom-up power. This is power from the trenches, power from the members. The authority rests in the members. You heard it in part one and part two. So this is an, an innately uh, Protestant way of looking at this kind of a question. So no, this does not arise. Uh, no, no, the Catholics never decided to create a, a church manual uh, like we have here. This isn't a, a Catholic thing in, in any way, shape, or form. But let's step back now and get the big picture, and I want to crack right into this. And let's talk about how the authority that rests in the membership is transformed into facts in the church structure. So every member in the church has a voice in choosing the officers of the church. Remember, authority rests in the membership, page 28. Every member, either directly or through representatives, has a voice. And actually, this echoes the practice of the early church at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. You'll remember the case there, right? Uh, new duties arose. The church was bursting at the seams. It was growing rapidly, and some people were being neglected. And so they appointed these deacons. They, they said, well, we're going to do this. Well, you choose, you, because the membership rested in the church, okay? You choose choose for yourselves seven persons, and they chose the deacons. They figured a criteria for them. The criteria is stated right there in Acts chapter 6. Uh, they took, and then they determined who those seven were. They named them right there. Those people became uh, church officers taking care of those particular duties. So this is just the way the early church worked, and that's the way we, we also attempt to work as well. So put simply, every member has a voice. The voice of that member is expressed either directly through direct voting, like in a church business meeting, or it's expressed indirectly by the election of officers or delegates. And so every member has a voice in the operation of the church because the authority rests in the membership. So there's kind of two styles in this. There's two approaches. So there's either expression by direct voice vote, so that's like in a church business meeting where all the members are gathered, the ones who come to attend the meeting, and then they directly vote. They're not voting for representatives. They just vote directly on whether they approve the budget or whatever the thing is that's happening in the business meeting. Or another way that it happens is through uh, what you might call a mini business meeting. What? What's a mini business meeting? Well, again, every occasion where you're doing a direct vote, that's the membership directly expressing its, its will, uh, the way God is leading it, and they express their will through a direct vote. And you might not think of it that way. You think of a business meeting as kind of a meeting that happens maybe once a year, and there's a big agenda, and everybody goes, and we look, we can approve the church budget, whatever. But actually, the church in business meets many times. So this is called the church in business. This is a direct voting uh, option. So in business, what do you have? Well, when when does that happen? Well, actually, there's these many business meetings. The church board, you know, your representative people on the board, they meet maybe 11 or 12 times a year, but the church in business may meet dozens of times a year. So, for example, every time you vote in a member, it, like for in a baptism or they give a profession of faith, every time the church pauses to have first and second reading and you're voting in a membership, like from a membership transfer from a sister church, and then the people have moved to your area, so they move their membership to that church. That's the church in business. It's a mini business meeting. Every time you have first and second reading for an officer nomination, because the church board can't, can't choose officers, those have to be elected by the church. So the board can recommend them, but it's actually the church that elects them. When your church elects delegates for a constituency meeting, that's direct action. That's the church in business, kind of a mini business meeting. So none of those cases we've talked about are the church in an indirect thing, like you have board members who are acting indirectly, expressing your voice because you voted for them, and now they're representing you on the board. Well, everything we've just talked about is the church in business. Those are like mini business meetings. It happens dozens of times a year, perhaps, in your church, whenever you have like a first or second reading of vote on something directly by the congregation. Those are effectively business meetings. And it's kind of interesting, this is, this is why the church, in the early days, we kind of got this format going, where you, before you do the main worship, there's kind of a section and announcements period. And it's the church grew so rapidly that we needed a time when people would move and move into the area. You needed time to transfer them in. You needed time to deal with the election of new church officers. And so our worship services often begin before we really get into the main worship service. We have kind of an announcement time. That's a time when often, not every Sabbath, but often we... Uh, have like these many business meetings. In effect, they're many business meetings. The people are voting directly. That's exactly what it is. You know, we transact a minimum of, of, of debate in those things usually, almost never. You know, we just vote. But those are, those are like little miniature. That's the church in business. That's what that is.
Now, on page 134, the World Church requires that every church hold a business meeting a minimum of once a year. Now, why is that? Well, that's because the determination has been made that the, the authority of the church rests in the membership, and you cannot rob the members of their voice. So when we have a church business meeting, we are doing that very thing. We are allowing members to speak. We're giving them voice because they have the voice. They are the membership. They get to vote directly. Now, maybe you wonder, who calls a business meeting? Well, I have it right here, and again, it's from page 134. Let me read it to you. The pastor or the board in consultation with and support of the pastor calls the meeting. Business meetings should be announced a week or two in advance of the regular Sabbath worship service with detail as to time and place. On down the page, it says the business meeting has authority over the board and may delegate responsibilities to the board in addition to those already assigned by the church manual. So that's how you have a business meeting. The pastor or the pastor with the board, they call the business meeting. Now, when your congregation is in kind of a mini business meeting uh, mode, the church is obliged to respect your vote, your direct vote on a matter. So let's just take a wild case here. Just suppose for a moment that your church hasn't held a church business meeting for a year and a half, okay? You've talked to the pastor. He hasn't, hold, he hasn't seem to want to hold one. You've talked to members on the board. They don't want to hold one. And now, you know, you're, you're outside the way the church works. You're outside the proper functioning of the church because the members are being robbed of voice. So suppose you have that situation. Is there anything you can do about it? You, just the random uh, John Smith, random member in the pew. Yes, there is. Now, in a case like that, you know, you've, you've already tried, but it, for whatever reason, they haven't held the meeting. So let's suppose that it's, it's, a, it's a, wor a day in worship. Your church is meeting and you have the announcement phase. And let's say that uh, some person is voted into membership. It's the second reading and they handle that. The elder handles the vote. All in favor of what I, all opposed vote nay. They say aye. The person's voted into membership. Now, the elders just finished a vote. It's a direct vote of the church. It's effectively a mini business meeting. And he's standing at the pulpit, or he's standing at the podium, and before he, he moves on and sits down or things move on to the regular worship service, you know, you can, as a member, you could do this. You could do something like this. You could stand up and just say uh, loudly, not disrespectfully, but you could say, uh, Brother Elder, it's unusual. He'd probably turn to you and look at you or say, uh, yes, Brother uh, so-and-so. At that point, you can say something like this. Brother Elder, th this church has not held a business meeting for 18 months. Uh, the World Church says that it's required once a year. And so we can say, I move that this church hold a business meeting uh, next month on a, on a date to be determined by the pastor and announced two weeks in advance, at least two weeks in advance, I so move. <laughs> probably, probably the elder will not know quite what to do. But you can then say, Brother Elder, at this time, you should you should ask for a second, if you would, please. You will perhaps say, well, is there a second? And someone will probably say, yes, I second the motion. The next thing to do is to vote. Say, all in favor, vote. And then if the group votes yes, why then that is binding. The pastor and the board have to go by it. The church in business has spoken. And then the pastor will set up the meeting. And you'll have your business meeting next month at, at the time appointed by the pastor. See how this might work. This could be useful for you. Uh, that's just a, a wild case, but there might be other kinds of ways that things aren't working out right between the pastor and the congregation, or there's something else going on. And, and if people are not following the proper uh, procedure, uh, they, they could be robbing members of their voice. And so by directly voting, that's the church in business, this could be settled and we're back in an orderly case there. No harm done, no hurt feelings, hopefully. We're just doing what's right. So I would say exercise some restraint with this approach. Uh, we don't want to get into big debates, usually on a day, a day of worship. But this can be useful in cases where, for whatever reason, uh, the pastor hasn't done what, uh, hasn't called the meeting that he's supposed to call. So this isn't against the pastor. This is just the church just doing what the church is obligated to do. So there's nothing wrong with it at all. In fact, this is just an example of uh, proper order. Now let me just address one other thing here, and that is that some persons seem to be determined to get into an adversarial relationship with the pastor or with the church board or with the conference president or something. Some people just seem like they're kind of looking looking for trouble. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. That's not the way we want things to be done. Hey, exercise some restraint. Avoid that kind of approach. Don't get into conflicts with people unless it's absolutely unavoidable. Work together. You know, you can get a lot further with kindness, with respect, don't assume these church leaders are bad guys. These, these, are, these are mostly good people. 
that, that want to serve the Lord Jesus, and you can help them. Just be, be kind and be generous. Be gracious. Forgive them if they say something silly. You can do that. God is big enough for that. You know, you might even find that they share interests and concerns very similar to your own. You know, so many things are possible if you just respectfully ask. ask maybe start by asking in private. Hey, pastor, hey, I noticed we haven't had a business meeting. I know things have been really busy. Uh, hey, could, could we schedule a church business meeting and just kind of have a report on everything like, like we're supposed to? Would, would you help us with that? Just to see if you can make a commitment. Yeah, yeah, we need to do that. Well, pastor, can we do it? Can we do it in the next, in the next two months, please? Could, could, we, could you plan for that? And a lot of times the pastor, he, 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 he'll work right with you. So don't, don't, be, uh, don't expect there's going to be a problem. And you won't have to perhaps go to a measure like having a, a, in the mini business meeting sort of calling, calling for something like that to happen. Get it, get it done privately. Get it done calmly. Expect good things, but, but help people. Sometimes some people need to, they need to help pin it down to a certain date or something, right? So, so anyway, you be their helper. Don't be their adversary. Be their helper. Be courteous. Be respectful. And try and approach where you're teaming with the, the church leadership. So now listen, we've laid some foundations in these first three presentations, right? In the church, authority is shared. The church board and even the church in business don't have unlimited authority. There are things we kind of assign to the conference, and, and we'll be talking about those authorities uh, coming right up. But next time, what I intend to do is, uh, is uh, begin to work on the relationship between the pastor and and the church board. And you think, well, the pastor can do almost anything. Actually, the pastor can do almost, can do very, a very limited set of things. His really, his authority is very strictly limited. Maybe in some, I think you're going to be surprised. Maybe you don't realize how limited his authority is. So we're just going to educate ourselves and it's going to be helpful for the church, helpful for the pastor, helpful for your congregation, and it'll be good. So let's see if we can get this uh, number four, maybe next week. And we'll carry on, and I, I know you're going to be surprised at what I share in the next meeting. May the God of heaven bless your local congregation of his church. Bless your pastor, bless your elders and leaders, bless every member.